And what is the brand promise underneath this concept? Now, you're all smart, skeptical people, so you should be asking yourselves, wait a minute, Chris, which evil? Um, because uh, you all know and can reference easily Socrates, who spoke through Plato in the Mino Dialogues, who said that no person consciously performs an act that they believe is evil. By the time they get to an act that another person would believe is evil, they've convinced themselves that A, it's not evil, or they've done the mental gymnastic to say, I'm part of a group that is exceptional and not, uh, ad not beholden to the normal rules. So looking for evil in the real world is an example to answer the question, what does evil look like, is problematic. Fortunately, we have another place that we can turn, and that is narrative. In narrative, we have characters who are evil. Oh, I'm doing lasers and blinding you and not actually doing the uh, advancing of the slides. Um, but in narrative, we have examples of characters who are created as evil, uh, who are, have external signals that this is an evil character. Um, so it's much easier to look at narrative in order to find examples of evil that we can say, yes, this was intended to be evil, and examine for its brand attributes. Uh, if I was a narrative generalist, I could talk broadly about uh, evil in, in storytelling, I'm not a generalist. Uh, I'm up here because for the past 12 years or so, I've examined technology in science fiction, television, and movies. I published a co-authored a book in 2012 called Make It So, and keep a blog called Sci-Fi Interfaces, where I deconstruct and criticize the technology in those properties. So the expertise that I bring to you today is science fiction interfaces, and that's the lens through which we're going to answer this question. And when you gather up all the sort of evil organization interfaces in science fiction and television, all with quotes, um, you find some patterns. The first thing I should note is that they all don't fall into patterns. Uh, there are some interfaces that just don't get a lot of design, not a lot of attention, or that don't really fall into some of the patterns that I'm going to discuss with you in my 15 minutes. Um, but evil is a behavior. It is not necessarily, you know, a uh, CSS entry. So when we do look at those things that exhibit patterns, uh, there are two salient features that I have identified. The first is that evil interfaces are red on black. <laughs> From Tron to Robocop to Battlestar Galactica, uh, it just goes on and on and on where red on black is like 75% of the examples of evil in this survey are red on black. Oh yeah, how? Sort of one of the most evil out there. Uh, let me give a couple of caveats to this. Because where red on black accounts for maybe 75% of the examples that I gathered together, there were other examples. Uh, and even though evil is most always red and black, red does not always equal evil. Sometimes it's just attention getting, as in these examples from Fifth Element Wally and Prometheus. Um, even Prometheus, it's just, it was a neutral technology, even though it was sort of dumb. And uh, as I said, 75% of the examples are red on black, but there are other examples too. Uh, slightly less than a fourth of them were sort of this sickly green. Uh, so you'll see Star Wars, Star Trek, RoboCop, Aliens. Um, uh, and that was a, a strong pattern, but not as strong as the red on black. And then there was a last color pattern, which was blue, sort of this calculating blue. And there are only a few examples of those. Uh, so let me modify my original statement that evil is red on black. It's mostly red on black. Uh, but in all of those cases, you will notice that it is highly saturated and high contrast. So, oh, here's the remainder of my examples that evil is red on black most of the time. And Spock is an evil, but he was in an evil Klingon ship, so that's why he showed up there. Um, so this first pattern that I identified, sort of in the clustering of interfaces, is that it was high saturation, high contrast, red on black. The second pattern I observed in this collection of interfaces is that they were pointy. So from the sharp angles, uh, lots of acute angles, simple lines that are sort of pokey, that horrible device there that's going in the chest. Um, even some of the biology of the characters using these things were especially pointy. 
Um, and that just uh, called out to me as I looked at this examples. So, feature number two, evil is pointy. <laughs> and that's it, those are the two patterns I found, but uh, I'm not the guy to sort of just leave it there as here's what I found. The second thing is, well, okay, why? Why is evil high contrast, high saturated, red on black and pointy? There are some nerdy answers. And I want to begin with this test. So this is a test that was first devised in 1929, uh, revised again in 1947, and tested again in 2001. And I'm just going to give you the name of these two objects, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand to tell me which object has which name. The two names are Maluma and Takete. I'll say it again because I saw a hand to an ear. One of them is called Maluma, and the other is called Takete. So I want you to raise your hand if you think the object on the right is the Takete. On your right. Now raise your hand if you think the object on the left is the Takete. Okay. That's actually right in line with the studies that have found. 95 to 98% of people will identify the object on the left as a taquete and the one on the right as a baluba or a maluma or a balba. Every time they test it, they change the names. I don't know why. But what was really interesting is in the 2001 version, they actually weren't just testing American undergraduates. They were also testing Tamil speakers in India, and they came up with the exact same findings. So it's not dependent on culture, it's not dependent on language. Um, and I raise this example partially because it tells us something important. And that is that there are human universal in the interpretations of forms. And now we're gonna put aside that because that's scientific. But now we're gonna go to Chris's conjecture in that I believe those universals come from nature. And if we look at nature for where are we going to find high contrast, high saturation patterns, takes us into evolutionary theory called aposomatics. Aposomatics is the tendency amongst dangerous and unsavory species to hold a bright, high contrast pattern. And the theory goes as, uh, as this. If you are a delicious species, <laughs> or one with, with a uh, very low ability to defend yourself, if you evolved a pattern like this, you would suddenly be very apparent to predators. You would get eaten, they would enjoy eating you, they would eat more, that trait would get winnowed out of the species very quickly. But if you were unsavory, unpleasant to eat like a stink bug, or aggressive and poisonous like say a black widow, this isn't actually a bad thing, this is a very good thing. Because if you were a predator approaching that little frog wearing a bright red coat and it spat poison at you, it's a poison dart frog, you would spend four days recovering and then go, wow, I really, we should be careful next time I see a frog wearing that coat, right? Um, all of those things you'll notice are high contrast, high saturation patterns. So I believe that this is a pattern that we recognize intuitively even if we don't know the crazy word aposomatics. And I'm gonna make one other addendum that evolutionary theory also identifies that there are freeloaders to this pattern. Speece oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The brand promise underneath aposomatics this is fun to say on camera, uh, tells any observer, don't fuck with me, <laughs> right? Uh, and then there are freeloaders to this pattern who say, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, you know that crazy snake that's raising poisonous? I'm totally one of them. Please don't mess with me. It's not true, but as long as the proportion of freeloaders to actually dangerous animals stays at a, a, at a constant. Uh, there can be freeloaders like this. It's called Batesian mimicry. Fascinating stuff. Um, so I think that's the reason why we get the high contrast, high saturation patterns, because we recognize this in the world from, the, from our experience of the world. Follow-up question was, okay, if we've got super saturated wasps, why don't we see any yellow evil interfaces? And I have a theory. But here we're putting down science again and just going with Chris's gut. Uh, and that is that there are two things that we also associate with danger uh, that is universal to humans. Uh, the first is blood. I know there are some people who get queasy looking at blood, so that's not real blood. That's cherry glazing. Um, but also the concept of night, right? So uh, blood is a strong signal for any human that has it uh, that if you see it, something's gone wrong. Some violence has probably occurred if not menstruation, if not uh, birthing. 
Um, but for the most part, in our day-to-day -day experience, uh, that might mean violence. So red is a big indicator. Uh, the second is nighttime. We are diurnal creatures. Did I say that right? Yes. Uh, are, we're optimized for life in the daytime. And any time we're in a dark environment, uh, it presents a threat to us. So I think that darkness and blood are the other cues that say, of the patterns that aposomatics gives us, red and black are the ones that resonate with humans the most. So that answers the question about why that part of evil. But the second part of evil is, well, okay, why pointy? And I think if high contrast, high saturation patterns are an associative threat, pointy is just a physical one. Right? We know about thorns, we know about claws, we know about teeth. At the very least, it's going to cause pain, but at the very most, it might eat you and devour your liver. Um, so I think it's really pretty easy to understand why those, these patterns from nature play out really easily in the depiction of evil in science fiction and narrative. Whew. Now, pretty close to the end of my time. I usually speak to diner, designers and uh, product managers when I speak on stage, so I can't help myself but finish with a two-part call to action if you are one of those jobs, which is, okay, what do we do with this information? What do we do with this pattern? Uh, and if your brand promise includes don't fuck with me, you can camp on this pattern, right? You can use a high contrast, high saturation palette. You can even go with red and black. Or you could go with one of the lesser colors, but make sure it's pointy. But once you're aware of this pattern, you can also avoid it if your brand promise does not include don't fuck with me, right? Children's toys, for instance. Let's not have them be pointy. Let's not have them with red on black. That's the end of my time with you. If you're interested in this sort of nerdery, I do publish to sci-fi interfaces about once a week uh, with similar topics and a similar degree of uh, dorkiness. Thank you so much.